Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Standing 8. I'm Paul Fitzgerald. And I'm Ben Damon, and that's Peter Sterling and Jeff Fennick. We're an illustrious cu- uh, custom here today. Uh, how are you going, fellas? Going great. Look, I'd, I'd like to apologise now because uh, my life is going to be fairly boring and uneventful following John Ibrahim. So I, 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 <laughs> Did you listen to that one? Or? I haven't, no. Oh, okay. N- not a, well, you've got, yeah, yeah, well, you've got a bit to live up to, so we yeah. want some well, stories. Exactly. Well, the pressure's on. but I've, well, you've, I've, got, you've got two die-hard Parramatta fans, long-suffering Parramatta mate, fans, and Jeff Finnick and myself. So. Mate, two Parramatta players, if you don't yeah. mind. <laughs> well, well, you, well, you, were, you right. were there the hey, year hey. that Jeff... Played uh, a couple of games in reserve. Great, you, you must have been shitting yourself, thinking here he oh. comes, he's going to take my spot. Ah, uh, well, I tell you one thing, about, <laughs> one thing about Jeff. He's mate. He gave everything that he had. He, he he was a goer. He was like one of those energetic bunnies that you wind up and, yeah. and just set him off. I remember the shoulder pads because I had a fair set of shoulder pads myself, but I reckon he had mine covered. I reckon I <laughs> twice, but, and he just mate anything that ran past him, he tackled. And unfortunately, on a couple of occasions, I read was a couple of his teammates that he, he wiped out as well. He just wasn't going to let anyone just the stats go up. past. But yeah. no, it was mate, it was great. You know, there was a lot of a lot of people who wanted to play great football never did. And Jeff can say that he wore the the, the, the blue and gold. 1990, I think, the year. What was the mood at the club like that year? Having Jeff around the club, it would have changed things, a personality like that, and, and the focus that it would have brought to the team well, as well. Well, Dave, Dave Lilliard tells a little story. He said, Jeff, I wouldn't believe it. I got to, to training, and he said, he uh, actually said, he thought something must have happened to Jack Gibson. He said, he thought somebody must have died. He said, there were that many cameras there. He thought, uh, wow, what's happened here? You know, and uh, yeah, then obviously I had signed a play. You turned know? up. Yeah, well, it, what it did, it, it upped the ante for us in regards to. I think we we wanted to impress him. You know, we wanted so mate, I, I didn't spend much time in the gym. I probably spent a bit more time when Jeff was there just because you felt that, you know, you you didn't wanna I guess we were looking at how we'd be seen through his eyes type thing. Um, and he was obviously coming across to try and do his best in a different sport, which I think is always an admirable thing. It's not an easy thing. So he lifted the place. And at that time, you know, we'd we'd had some lean years. So it was it was a positive for us. Yeah, but before we go any steps first, let me just say, for me, sitting here with this guy, I am, like I said, I'd give all my belts away to to have done and won some of the awards that he's done. This is um, somebody who I love, is my idol, I am, and I'm so honoured that you're here with me today, Sterling. No, Thank you so nice, much. Nice of you to say. Thank he you. says it to every guest that sits no, here outside, no, no, but that's, no, it's, it's, no, it's, no, it's appreciated for me. We go back a long way, and um, yeah, I, I, long time since I've been here, actually, probably. I came once and he never invited me back, so I don't know what I did wrong the first time. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's uh, I, I, you know I appreciate what he's done at sport. He's a he's a he's a legend in in the boxing game, and uh, everybody loves him. And I'm like everybody else to to be able to say I had an association with him. Uh, you know, I'm very honoured. They were massive years for Parramatta, the Jeff Fennick years. Um, we're a little bit younger than you, but what were those years like uh, in an Australian sporting landscape, being a, a star at Parramatta, but also with what Jeff was doing? Well, they were great times. You know, obviously um, for Parramatta in the 80s, you know, they were the golden days and when we won premierships and, and we weren't winning them, we weren't far away from, from winning them. But then, you know, towards the end of the 80s, I think on the back of some poor recruitment and you know, things change, it, it's hard to stay at the top. You know, it's difficult to get there, but it's harder to stay there as well. And we kind of lost our way a, a little bit. Um, so it was it, w- it was difficult, but, you know, the, the difficult times are what make the good times exactly that. You know, I, I came in, I, I, pl- I played my first grand final when I'd, I'd only just turned 21. You know, and and that was that was you know young. I hadn't played that many first grade games. We won in eighty one. We win in eighty two and eighty three. And you kind of think, well, this is what happened. Well, well you don't think it's easy, but you know you're enjoying a lot of success. And then we went close again in eighty four and eighty five. We win in eighty six, and you know all of that success came, and you just thought it would continue, um, but but it doesn't. So uh, th- those years were kind of thinking, oh well. You know, I well, I certainly enjoyed the the, su- the success and all the trappings of, but it just rammed home the fact that you know how fortunate we'd been and 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 that um, to have success so early because it doesn't come easy, and it was rammed home in those years. I didn't have a lot. Of, you know, we we didn't play much final football in the last couple of years of my career, but I, I think I probably played my best football then because you're under duress and you're under pressure, and um, you know times were tough. What do you think made Parramatta so successful during the 80s? Obviously, 81, 82, 83, 86. Yeah, I think any team to, to win a premiership, they, they have to have the right balance. 
you know, you need to have experienced players there, you need to have some old heads, but you need some, you know, some young players coming through and some exciting talent. Um, and Parramatta, they'd, they'd gone close, obviously, in the late 70s, got beaten in 76, there was the replay in, in 77. So you know, they, they had wonderful players, mm. but just got beaten by, by better sides or were just looking for the, for the edge. And, and to me, I suppose the edge came when Jack Gibson arrived at the club. You know, he was just the perfect person to to bring all of that together, to give us the confidence to go out there and, and be successful. And, you know, I'm the luckiest person in the world, guys. I, 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 had, I played my career with Ray Price on one side and Brett Kenny on the other. Now, if you couldn't play well between those two blokes, you couldn't play. Yeah. But I, I look, you know, back at that time, a, a guy like Ron Hilditch. You know, I, I don't think a tougher player ever graced the field. And Bob O'Reilly was brought back to the club by Jack Gibson. He was, he was in his 30s, he was on one leg. But if you look back at the 1981 Grand Final, he was the best on the on the paddock that afternoon. Yes. Stella, what was it about Jack? What 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 did he bring to the club? What did he bring to to you guys? Is like for me, like I said, Johnny Lewis. Um, I would have walked through a brick wall if he yeah. if he told me to do that. Was Jack similar? I, I could talk about Jack all day, Jeff. He when he first came to the club, you know, we were like everybody else. You know, we didn't quite know what we were getting. You know, we didn't know what to expect. He had he had a, a reputation type thing, and he but he came and he had this aura about him, and the, and part of that aura seemed to be that kind of an unapproachability. Um, but when he when he came to the club and started to you know, have relationships with the players. Like, he was the most approachable bloke in the world. Jack Gibson only coached me for three years, but I learnt more in those three years than I did in the 15 that I played. And whilst the fact he only coached me for three years, 20 years later, if I had any problem in my life or any advice I needed, Jack was the first person I'd ring and I know he welcomed the phone call. Any player who played under Jack Gibson will tell you that he cared more for you off the field than teaching you to run past tackle or kick. You know? See, that, that, makes was, you, yeah. that makes you play better. I mean, that, you know, that just makes you want to win more than for yourself, but, you know, you're doing something special for the coach. And that, that was a very so such a uh, similar relationship that I had with Johnny Lewis. Um, although I won these world title fights, I was more happy seeing Johnny happy than, than being happy myself. The, the greatest reward I ever got out of the game, and, I, you know, I was fortunate to, to feature in, you know, some of those times, <laughs> The greatest thing that could happen for me was at the end of the game, in the sheds, if Jack walked past and looked at me and said, you did good, then that was that, that, was, that, that was all I ever ever played for and I never, ever wanted to disappoint him. Um, and my, he loved me. There wouldn't and, have been too I, many I weeks him. you didn't say it to you still. Oh, like, that's, you know, it was, you right. know, he didn't... Well, if I'm talking about Jack Gibson, I have to mention Ron Massey as well. Yes. Uh, it, he was, it was the yin and the yang. And, yeah. you know, Jack Gibson probably wasn't the greatest tactical coach, um, but his man management, and I know that that's more a catch cry in today's game, but back then it wasn't really, you know, you never heard of, of a coach being a man no, manager, that but that's what Jack man. did so well. Um, it was Ron Massey who went through all the videos and did that kind of, of work, and uh, even early on, it, it, we'd, be, we'd be at a team meeting and Jack would, would, would talk and he'd get stuck on a word and Mass would put the word in and Jack would continue <laughs> as though there was no yeah. interruption time. That was the relationship that they had. Yeah. Ron Massey was a great judge of football talent as well um, and so they, they, were a, they were a wonderful team and um, I think sometimes Ron probably doesn't get as, as enough recognition as, as what he should because he, yeah, they were, they were, together they were fantastic. It was a combination. Yeah, absolutely. And with, with Jack, it's, I think it's a great quality to have an economy of words. You know, I, I think some coaches actually, they'll talk for the sake of talking or to fill a void or to justify their position. From my memory, I don't remember Jack Gibson coming down at half time in one of the grand finals against Manly in 82 or 83. The coach didn't even come down to the shed. We had a good lead. We'd put together a really good first 40 minutes. And by Jack n not coming down... I've never been more confident running out for a second half because I knew basically what he was saying by not coming in the shed was don't change anything, just continue doing oh. what you're doing. And that and that's what we did. If he'd have come down and, as I say, just tried to say something for the sake, it, it wouldn't have had the same impact. Mm. But it was the greatest show of confidence I've ever had from from a, a coach in that, in that position. It, he was just saying, it's all good, guys, just, yeah. So still, I... 
I sit here and I listen to you and I've, obviously I followed you my whole life. Why didn't you coach? I, I thought you would have been the greatest coach. <laughs> Too smart, mate. Well, I can, no, 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 look, it's, it's, it's something that I wonder when it's, it's all over. And my association with rugby league has been a long time now. I played for 15 years and I've been in the media by the time I finish up, it'll be 30 years. So, And I wonder at the end of that, Jeff, if I will look back and say, you know, I wonder or if what... I had a couple of opportunities. I was very close, um, almost said yes to Bob Millwood um, to coach down at, at Illawarra. And there are a couple of other little... But I suppose um, the opportunity came up to go in the media and I was terrified when I retired, Jeff. I was 32 and it was a stark realisation when I hung up my boots that the bulk of my working life was still in front of me. I didn't have a trade. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I suppose for me, I'd had a bad shoulder. The silver lining of the black cloud of injury for me was the fact that whilst I was rehabbing for maybe that last couple of, of seasons and not playing a lot of footy, I was actually doing some media work. And so there was an opportunity when I retired and, and the transition was easier to step into it because I'd done some of that kind of stuff. A lot less pressure too, huh? Well, you know, it's coaches, uh, they've been described to me in two ways, that um, coaches, they sleep like babies because they wake up every two hours crying. Now, when I heard that they sleep like babies, I love my sleep, I'm a Rip Van Winkle, so that appealed. But then when they said they wake up every two hours crying, that, that's... And there are only two types of coaches, ones who've been, co- have been sacked and ones who are waiting to be sacked. So it, it's not – but that's not – you know, I don't think that's a deterrent to go in because coaching is the closest thing that you can have to being a player in regards to being in that inner sanctum of a club situation. When I retired, I think it was on a Sunday – or no, I think the announcement was on a Monday or a Tuesday. On the Thursday night, Jeff, I sat at home on my couch bawling my eyes out because I was lost. I didn't – every Thursday night – for 15 years, I was down with the boys training and I knew where I was supposed to be and I knew, you know, I think we're creatures of habit. You, you like to know what you know. I sat at home. I didn't know it had just been just been taken away from me um, and all of a sudden you're not part of that inner sanctum anymore. And it's not because the players make you feel like that. It's just, it's just, re- you just... That's just the way it is. See, what Sterlo is saying now, this, this should be told because a lot of players, um, that's why they get depressed and they do crazy things after sport because they don't know what to do and that's more in, in the hands of the league these days to make sure that, that there's something there for them. They have a platform for them after, after sport. It's the same as us fighters. That's why fighters make comebacks all the time. They make comebacks who we always think we're going to win. We don't know what to do. So you know, it's, it's, it's great to get that out there because, like I said, um, and this is years ago, and um, like I said, uh, I just think it's so, so important to, to have another platform or to have something uh, ready after sport. Look, look at the, the pandemic at the moment. Just say, we can never play again. What are these guys going to do? There's nothing. What, what have they got, you know? Well, look, the good thing about the game now, Jeff, is that pretty much well, all the clubs that I know of, they are very much aware of, of making certain that players are ready to do something when they retire. The average career of a rugby league first grader is about 40 games. Now, you get some, you know, he could have Cameron Smith who will never stop playing, who, you know, plays three, four, three, hundred, four hundred. But there are a lot of blokes who only play one or two. So the average is 40 games. That's a season and a half. So the first question that's, I would hope every club now asks the players, and I know it happens, and I've spoken to Phil Gould about this, and he's very much aware of, you know, young players coming. When players sit down now, the club will say to that young player who's, you know, he's ready to go. He's been waiting for this all his life and he's got huge dreams. And he thinks so he's, he's going to play 300 plays. games. Well, the first question they ask now is, what are you going to do when this doesn't work out? Now, that sits him back on the end. What do you mean? Gonna, well, the chances are, the odds are, that this is not going to work out. So now I, I know it, um, again, m- most clubs, as part of the contract, when they sign that, they sign on at Parramatta, they have to come up with 10, um, 10 units. Now... Two units might be bookkeeping, two units might be business management, one unit might be golf, whatever. They've got to be doing something when they're away from from training and it's got to be something that gets them prepared for life after football, which wasn't the case back back in our time. Um, and And we need to be really careful of our young players because they live in an unreal world. And I don't want to get on the soapbox here, but our young players tend to be elite sportsmen at school, so they get treated differently. When they finish schooling, 
and they've got ability and talent and, you know, all clubs now, they want to, they want to get that. They, they don't want to miss out. Of on course. So, so they'll throw a lot of dollars at young players and they'll pay them on potential, not on performance. It was the other way around in our time. You know, I earned more, more money out of the game after I'd stopped playing for my state and my country, but you knew that it would come. If you, if you played well and did the right thing, that would come. These days they get the money up front. Now, our young players these days, they don't understand repercussions because they've never had any. Yep. They honestly think because they've, I don't want to use the word spoiled, but in some ways it is, but it's an unreal world. They think if something goes wrong, um, I don't want to use an example, if they get in a car and they've had a drink or whatever, the back of the, it's actually a mentality that they think if they get pulled over, it'll be okay. Well, they've been in a bubble. Because it always has been. They live in a bubble. That's exactly mm. right. And it's really difficult to put old head on young shoulders. Now, I'm not having a shot at our young players here, but somehow we have got to get into their minds an understanding of what they're jeopardising. You know, what they're with through some bad behaviour, what, what they're jeopardising, um, because the alternative for so many of them is to be doing some manual labour, digging a trench, and there's no disrespect to people who dig trenches. It's good, hard work and honest work. But I know what they'd rather be doing. Mm. So in so, saying that, uh, it's a very different world now for a rugby league player. Would you have rather had your time now or are you happy that it all happened when it happened? It's a, it's a different landscape in terms of media focus, social media and, and all of those bits and pieces, but there's more money in the game now. Yeah, I, look, I... I, I guess the money side of things, it's it's all relative. You know, I, yeah. I got paid great money back then, but obviously nowhere near the dollars, but mm. the, you know, the price of living wasn't yeah, anything yeah, like yeah. it was either. Um, I, I, look, I, I'm old school. I, I love the time that I came through, but I think, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd have a great time now as well because I, I, I just love playing with my mates and I love, you know, doing something that I was passionate about. I don't want to use the cliche that you do it for nothing, but you would. So to get paid for it yeah. was fantastic. The, the thing that I would hate, Ben, today is social media. Yeah. Is that, um, you know, I, I, I guess, again, through the pandemic, we've seen social media at its very best. You know, people being creative and, and being able to keep up relationships with other people we couldn't do so physically, so, yeah. so we, we do it that way. But the other side of it, the, the dark side of it, um, you know, I, I'm the kind of person, I don't think anybody cares what I had for breakfast or what I thought of this movie or those kind of things. So, I, you know, there's no reason for me to put that kind of stuff out. But the thing about social media, I've got a, I've got a 21-year-old daughter and if you're not part of social media, it's not as though you're ostracised, but you are an outsider. Mm. You know, that's just the yeah. way that our you young people... You miss out on what's going on. Exactly right. And that's a huge motivator to be, you know, we all want to be a part of something. Um, so maybe there'd be some pressure there to, to be a part of it. But I think social media can be a fantastic thing, but I can think I think it can be a really dangerous one as well. And our young players still don't understand that, obviously, with some of the, you know, the recent... Um, uh, incidents. Well, we spoke about it last week still. And I said, like, well, I'm, I'm, look, I would have loved the fight in Sarah as well. I think it, a, lo a lot of things would have been great, but wow, some things that we got up to, if, if there were cameras there, I'd, I'd be spending the rest of my life in jail. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm just honest. And me and the whole team would be, we'd have a, you know, yeah. we'd have a whole, blo I mean, yeah, it was crazy. So I'm, I'm pretty happy that I, you know, fought 20 years ago. Do you think there's more pressure on players as a result now? Is it, is it harder to be a professional rugby league player in Australia now than it was in your day? I don't know about harder. I think it's a blessed life. You yeah. know, they, they go to training and you, know, they, you, you get into you get spoiled in so many different ways. It's, it's a blessed existence. I think they can sometimes make it hard for themselves by the very things that we're talking about now. You know, 100%. It's, it's, Why do you think they still get into trouble? The play, there's so much education, and you know the clubs look after the players so well. For, for what I just said, it, it, they it's they broke. think it'll be okay. They yeah. they've, they've they they don't understand repercussions until they're actually hit by them, um, and, and even then we still just don't seem to learn. So I, I don't know. You know, it's it's like I say, hard. It's very hard to put wise old heads on young shoulders, but we just continue the battle. Yeah, you know, so I want to ask you a couple of questions about. Some of the older Parramatta sides, like cause earlier today, I heard you bringing up a little halfback named John Colk and those guys. And what was it like? Were you a, a Parramatta fan watching those guys earlier? Jeff, I, I hate to admit, I was the staunchest manly supporter that oh. ever lived. I, when I grew up in Wagga, I, I couldn't go to school on a Monday if we got beaten on the weekend. That's how bad I felt about things. I'm still devastated to the, this day that 
Uh, I, I got a, a manly jersey for my uh, for a birthday, and somebody stole it off the clothesline. I didn't leave the house for a couple of weeks. I was, no. well, they never stole it; they burnt it. <laughs> well, they maybe, burnt maybe it. so, but um, but I got the opportunity to come down. Um, I, I played Austra- uh, not Australian schoolboys, but I played schoolboy representative football for, for CHS and. Um, and, and lo- alongside you know, guys like Chris Mortimer and Brian mm. Batiste and that, and Ron Morley and Terry Fernley. Ron Morley was the the, the boss at, at Parramatta at the time, and Terry Fernley was obviously the coach. And they came down and met my, my father and myself uh, in Wagga. My, my, my mum passed away when I was only nine, so it was. Uh, they came down and met with dad and myself, and it would ca- kind of came out of the blue. You know, I was only. Six 16 or about to turn 17 at the time. That was really young. Um, but when they came down and said that we'd like you to come up, I thought that even then I realised that some, you know, opportunities don't come around that often. And if I didn't grab that, and there was a bit of criticism at the time that I was too young, but I thought, you know, I could, I could do an ACL the following week and never be heard of again mm-hmm. and never have an opportunity. So I, I, I thought, well, yeah, well, you know, why not? And, and I, I hadn't really... You know, Parramatta had been successful at the time. Obviously, they'd only just been beaten the grand yeah. final, so I knew I was going to a strong club. But I, we asked around, and I, I knew I was going to a club who looked after their young players, and that was obviously the most important thing for, for Dad and and for myself. And so, um, jumped on the train, came up, and I actually stayed out at Terry Fernley's place for the first week, and it was it was blessed. Mm-hmm. I, I had a great time out there, and Terry was a wonderful man, and. Um, looked after me and 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 the club. Now the, the the thing back then, Jeff, I suppose, is that coming to Sydney was was difficult in regards to Sydney can be a very impersonal, very selfish place. You know, especially coming from a little country town like Wagga, where you walk down the main street and you know everybody. But going into a club situation, I had fifty five ready made friends because you had the three grades yeah, that all trained together. So that was, and and you find your way. And I actually did my last year of schooling at Fairfield Patrician Brothers. And so that was um, – now, that was another avenue where there were, I was around people who, you know, be- became friendly with, and, and that was great. And I got to mix or be under the direction of a couple of really important people at, at, at Patrician Brothers as well. Brother Angus was the principal, and there was a, a brother called Brother Christopher who was second in charge out there. And they're two of the most magnificent men I've ever been around. Like, I'd, it was a culture shock for me. I'd already – I'd always gone to a co-educational school – to go to a college and be taught by blokes in frocks was a very you – know, it was something, something that I had experienced for. And might explain some things when it comes to the footy show in wearing that. But um, it, it, they – I remember we we made the, the final of the AMCO Shield that year, which was a schoolboys competition, and I nearly got stood down from that game because I didn't have an assignment in, which I got done uh-huh. quickly. So, you know, you didn't play – footy there which and it had a great reputation still does as a as a as a sporting school you didn't do any of that unless your work was up up to, to date so I, I needed that a, a, as well so coming coming to Sydney I, I didn't quite know you know I you know, Parramatta I didn't dislike them whatever I'd been a manly supporter but coming down and getting looked after so well you know you turned very very quickly and all of a sudden Bob Fulton wasn't my pinup anymore and um, I was educated let's say so you played him. I reckon one of the greatest teams ever. Who, who was the best Parramatta player you played with? Well, the best player I ever played with was Ray Price. Um, Ray is the most disciplined and dedicated player I ever played with. With a, a will to win, second to none. It, I always describe Ray Price. If there was a ball lying on the ground and six players dived on it, Ray would be the last one up. It had blood streaming from his head. But the most important thing, he'd have the ball tucked under his arm. You know, if there was a scrap on, he he'd win it every time. You know, and he, I just know that when I was playing, I looked across at Ray Price. If he was getting changed in the sheds, I got very confident that we were going to be okay that afternoon. Yeah. Um, the most naturally gifted player was Brett Kenny. You know, you'd sit back and watch Brett. Sometimes in our game, the way players move, they're, they're poetry in motion. What about Zip Zip? Well, Zip was different. Zip Zip. I, I, Steve Ella got carried off Brookvale Oval in 1978. I wasn't playing first grade that year. Uh, he was that good. He was. And when they carried him past me, I looked at his knee and I thought, he won't not, not just play again. He may not walk again. 
He, he got the worst knee injury you've ever seen. So for Steve Eller to come back and do what he did was a testament to how hard he worked and, and again, you know, the desire and that to, to be successful. He, 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 he could have been the best of everybody if his body hadn't have let him down early on or, or he hadn't have copped such, such an injury. But Brett, Brett Kenny was he, – he could have been the best – baseball player Australia ever produced. His father, Alan, was a very, very good player and that's what his forte was early on. Just great hand-eye coordination. So just we were, we were so grateful that he decided to put that energy into, into rugby league. When Brett joined the club, I was playing under 23s at the time, and he sat on the sideline for maybe four or five weeks and he was the most unlikely looking bloke you'd ever seen. He was skinny, he, was, he wasn't the best looking bloke. He had, I reckon back at school, when there was a sporting event and, you, you know, you got to pick teams, he'd be the last bloke picked. You know, he <laughs> just didn't look. And we played at Lidcombe Oval one afternoon in the 23s and it was his first time that he'd, he'd run on. And he came on and in five minutes, like the first five minutes, he, he soared above everybody else and plucked a bomb out of the air and scored a try. And we thought, well, that was, that was all right. Yeah. Five minutes later, he took an intercept, beat three blokes on a 60-metre run to the try line, scored two tries. And then he finished by beating another six blokes just in a weaving run, scored a hat-trick and we looked at him and thought, oh, OK, we, we get it. Yeah, mm-hmm. we, we know why he's here. He played a couple of weeks in under 23s, got promoted to first grade and never played anywhere else again. Uh, he was just a freakish talent. Um, Jeff, we talked about your brief uh, foray into rugby league uh, a little bit earlier, but uh, we haven't talked about it on this show. Do you want to talk about um, why that came about, why you announced your retirement after that fight in 89 and then and went to Parramatta? What, what was going on and what was the process like for you? Well, I announced my retirement <coughs> for the wrong reasons, um, although I had two broken hands and just had a tough fight. Um, at the time, my promoter, Bill Morty, was in war against um, IMG, who just began to manage me and all it was was about money and then finally I'd, I'd got paid and what I deserved because IMG made sure I got paid what I deserved and I'll never forget just walking back to the dressing room and all I could hear was, uh, you know, Bill had lost money and so-and-so and now they, they, were, they were arguing. And as I went to the press conference, I thought, wow, you know, I didn't want to see Bill upset. I didn't, you know, I, I knew that what Kerry Packer and James done for me getting IMG had just made me triple what I'd ever earned before, over triple. And um, I was put in a position and I said, I was just, um, yeah, although it was, it was tearful and it was, you know, not the best thing, I, I, I announced my retirement. And at the, at the first stage, I didn't really think of playing rugby <laughs> league, but after about five or six weeks of retirement, my weight went from... 57 to about 70 kilos, and wow. And when I was a rugby league player, I was like 48, 50 kilos. So I thought I would love to try to play rugby league with a bit of weight on because that's all I wanted to be. Like I said, if I could give all my belts away to have a couple of these awards that Sterlo's got, I'd do it straight away. I love that. All I ever want to do is be a rugby league player from, from four years of age. That's all I've ever done. I played rugby league, and I got that opportunity. And then, wow, yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll never forget being at the Oval and running around with. Sturlow and the guys and Brett Kenny and Dave Lilliard and those guys and who are still my great friends today and um, yeah it was like it was for me it was like a, gr- a dream come true it was like I was in Disneyland as a, a little kid that somewhere I never thought I'd be and um, yeah I just I just wanted to go out and show people because I played rugby league all my life and I knew I could play and I obviously knew I wasn't going to be this superstar but I knew the thing that always got me into all the rep teams as I did, I tackled more than everybody else and I never gave up and I thought if I just use the same, you know, you know um, method here, I'll enjoy it and that's, you know, I went there, I had that couple of games for um, uh, the Wanderers and I played for Parramatta and then Jeff Harding um, was fighting overseas and I asked if I could go and watch him come back and I'll never forget, like, I got permission to go and um, straight away I was invited back to train and play with Parramatta and I thought, that was the Andre's fair. fight. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. wasn't fair for me to, to be able to take a, a week or two off and then go back. So I thought maybe I'd better do what I do best and I went back into boxing. But, I, you, but I loved it. Do you think it was because you wanted to be a part of a team environment? Is that why you'd prefer the processes of rugby league to, to boxing as an individual sport? No, not really, Am I loved everything that boxing represented. I loved, like I said, I, I loved more seeing my team around me celebrate my victory than myself. I just loved them um, making everybody else happy. I loved proving what Johnny Lewis thought I could do. I, I loved 
delivering. I loved it when people doubted me and I, I delivered. I, lo- I loved it more than anything. And that, that was individually, but although boxing is an individual sport, I had a, a, a great team around me and um, I don't think I could have done it without the team and without the the guys who ran with me every morning and sparred with me every day. And like I look at it today and I think, wow, you know, um, we look at brain injuries and stuff like that and I think, wow, some of the guys that... Shit, I hit for years and years. I really feel it, it makes me it makes me wonder today. But like I said, um, again, um, I have no doubt if I could sit down now and think, what would I would have rather been being three time world champion or be a first grade football player for Parramatta? I'd I'd play for Parramatta any day. So it's it's it, man. It's interesting listening to that because you know, I I'd never played an individual sport. If I could be anything, I'd be a professional golfer. You know, that, yeah. that's because we all want to do something different, don't we? You know, but I look at. When I think of rugby league as a team sport, one of the greatest things I got out of that was the relationships with players that were during the course of a game, if I was down on the ground and I had nothing left, if I was fatigued and and physically spent, I knew with 100% certainty that the bloke on one side and the other bloke on the other side would pick me up, put me back in the line and say, we've got your back. You know, and these are guys that I necessarily might not have, you know, socialised with mm. that much, you know. But that was the understanding and the relationship, and that's you don't find that in many places in life where you've got complete faith that someone's got your back when you when you're down. You know? I, I I'm assuming that in the individual sport, like Jeff's talking about in, in boxing. For him, that was Johnny Lewis and those kind of people that were, you know, there. Now, in the in the tough times and the down times, and especially the physically tough times, they're there for you. Mm. And that's what I think. You know, maybe we both miss being out of, you know, elite professional sport is that you don't find that in other areas of your life. Yeah. Sterling, what do you think made you so successful? You had a really, you achieved everything in rugby league, rugby league hall of fame, premiership, state of origins. Played for Australia, and you've had this great media career post. Should be the ninth career. immortal. No, no, no. no, I, I, no. What, what drives your success? What, what, what do you think it, you can attribute that to? Oh, look, I, I'd like to think that you know I was dedicated to what I, I'm. I, I was passionate about the game, you know, and and we're probably not passionate about enough things in life, unfortunately, you because know, I've got no doubt that the degree of success we have is in direct relation to how fiercely the fire burns in our belly. And it, my timing was excellent. I went to the right club at the right time. I played with the right players. But I worked hard and, you know, I, I had ambition. I had a drive and I wanted to, to wring every little bit out of it that I could. I wasn't the biggest. I wasn't the fastest or any of those things. I, I, I think mentally I was as good as any player in the game. I think yep. that... My concentration, I was as good in the 89th minute as I was in the – or the 79th minute as I was in the 7th. Um, and that made up in a lot of ways for the fact that I, I wasn't, you know, physically, um, you know, as as attuned as, as other uh, other players. But I think in the head uh, – the nicest, the nicest compliment I ever got out of the game where Warren Ryan once said that I was quick between the ears. Yeah. And that was – you know, if I could play my career being that, then – and that would be great. But I, I just wanted to get the best out of what I had to offer. So that's the one thing I say to these guys and everybody all the time, I say to all my guys I train, forget it, man, people talk about people with heart. The heart's got nothing to do with it. It's all from the head. That this, doesn't, this doesn't send a message to you anyway. It's, it's, if, if, you're, if you're mentally prepared and you're mentally ready for anything, you can do extraordinary and amazing things. And, um, I mean, it's, it's, to be great, isn't it? You, you've, got, you've got to be... You know, have have something between those ears, and you've got to be smart. And to be the best fighter in the world, the, it wasn't because I was the toughest; it was because I was smart. I fought with broken hands, and the the reason why I was able to do that was because I was mentally prepared for that, and I knew how to use everything else as as advantages as well. Because I had sore hands, and if you don't think you can't do that, and I, like I said, I I kind of think that the word and how people talk about this guy had a massive heart. I, I, everybody's got the same size heart, I believe. It's just uh, who gets mentally prepared better and uh, who who knows they can do the work. If you've done your homework and you've you've done your preparation, um, I think it, it's just part and parcel. You'll go out and be able to, to achieve what you want to achieve. So, uh, like I said, I'm a strong believer in what Bryce Courtney wrote in his book, First From the Head and Then From Your Heart. Yeah. And preparation's everything. Yeah. yeah that's and, and that's physical and mental. You know, we, we, we were encouraged to write goals down on a piece of paper and put them up on the bedroom wall. 
so that they were the, the first thing you saw when you woke up in the morning and the last thing you, you saw before you went to, to bed at night. Still, I said the same thing. In one of my things, I used to write my little things down. My preparation for the, 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 the day after the next day was always done the, the night before. I used to look at them and know exactly what I had to uh, do. And by th- being encouraged to write them down, if you, if you write them yourself, you're kind of making a contract with yourself and yep. they should be the hardest contracts to break, the ones you make with yourself. Yep. But So I had, to, I, had to work, I had to work hard physically and mentally um, to be the best I could be, but you kind of embrace that preparation. It's, you know, I'm a big believer in mental rehearsal, like seeing yourself being successful. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how the sort of the mental transcends the physical anyway. Yeah. Still, who was the hardest guy or the best, the best player you played against in, in another team? Yeah, Wally, Wally Lewis. Uh-huh. Yeah, the king. He, um, the great players, and, and and Wally, Wally is, Wally's, the, the, he's an immortal, and you know that that's, and he deserves to be an immortal because the great players at the big moments in games, at the at the most difficult times, find something, come up with the right play, and they make it look simple. Now, if you go back and have a look at Wally Lewis in key moments in Origin games and that, he'll come up with a play and you just look at it and think, well, how – why didn't we stop that? Like, how mm. – but he just – and in those moments, he wanted the football in his hands. You know, when the game is there for the for – the, you know, can go either way and it's there for the taking, Wally always put his hand up and he invariably came up with the right play. Um, you were talking a lot about what's between the ears of footballers and boxers. Um, a, a lot of discussion at the moment uh, globally about brain injuries and um, and the impacts of uh, of what's happening to, to players and to boxers. Um, Jeff's come out and said that he's donating his brain to science. Um, I think have you said the same uh, thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was the reasoning for you um, in making that decision? I just think that it can help. Um, you know, the, the one thing that we need to make sure our game offers is is player welfare. And I think you know we've all seen what's happened over in America with the the, um, the investigations into CTE, C- CTE yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know it's had huge ramifications over there in regards to the legal side of things. Look, I would I would play my sport if they asked me to sign a waiver, um, and and that this could happen to me, and I wouldn't take action. I would sign that in a heartbeat, you know, because that's just. The game gave the game has given me everything in in some. I, I met my wife through an indirect way through the game, you know. So everything that everything good in my life has either been a direct or an indirect result of my chosen sport. But if we can if we can make sure that the game is as safe as it can be for for players in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years to come, then I think we have an obligation and a responsibility to the game to do that. And if my brain, along with all other brains, um, can give us a greater understanding of the steps that need to be taken, then that's an easy thing for me to do. There's a situation even this week with Mitchell Pearce having been knocked out badly last week and um, come, potentially coming back as soon as this week. What do you think the game – how do you think the game is doing with regards to that at the moment? Oh, that's, it's a good point and I think that, you know, there's a strong case that Mitchell shouldn't be playing this week. Uh, what boxing is ninety days? Yeah, well, yeah, but, and there, but there's, there's some technology out there now. Stuart Duncan's got some some brain devices mm-hmm. that you can use there and then on the spot at, at, at the ground to see how bad the concussion is. To see, but we've got to, we, we've got to invest in this stuff because it's <coughs> the future, you know. I mean, you know and of course, Mitchell wants to play. That's again, that's what yep. Sterling said. He'd sign away of every every player, every fighter in the world. We know what what comes with our sport. We know that. Yeah, the ramifications. We know that later on in life, I mean, we, we see people. We think, "Wow!" But we, we always think it's never going to happen to us. But now we need. Um, we just need the, the, the game to invest more into the into safety after this, after this is this is over. And we need to be protected from ourselves. Yeah, yeah that's and the, yeah, because that is that is the mentality. Yeah, that, um, yeah. you know, we need smarter people to know. And like I say, if the game can be safer in ten years' time because of something um, that we can contribute in a, in a minor way or a small way. Um, then that's got to be a positive. It's got to be a good thing. Talking about rugby league and boxing, obviously Las Vegas is the home of boxing. There was a particular state of origin match that was played in Los Angeles. Um, sometimes the Americans have always shown a lot of interest in, in rugby league because it's such a, a tough combative sport. But do you want to tell us about that particular trip? Not time? really, but I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's 87, the, the year that um, state of origin was taken to um, Long Beach in California. 
Um, yeah, just uh, I'll encapsulate as quickly as I can. Uh, obviously, um, went across there. We'd been beaten 2-1 by Queensland in the series that year and Wayne Pearce had captained the Blues that year but didn't make that trip because he was staying back for the birth of one of his children. So I got to captain New South Wales for the first only time, which I was, you know, I was feeling great about. And, and we were pretty fair dinkum about it. We were looking to go over there and exact some revenge and you know, make it a two-all scoreline. Queensland saw it for what it was. It was a trip away and um, they enjoyed themselves whilst we trained hard. And um, and obviously the the banner is something that um, has gone down in some kind of folklore or something. <laughs> I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, the morning of the game, this young lady walked up to me and said, excuse me, Peter, um, I made the banner that you're running through tonight and she wanted to explain to me how to run through the banner. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not big, I'm not strong, I'm not fast, but I'm thinking, crate banner, I'll handle this. And the boys were <laughs> heading off to have some lunch and I kind of fobbed her off because I was wanted to go and have lunch with... Anyway, the game came around that night and it was, it was a good, healthy crowd there, about 12,000 people, which was nice. But in the back of my mind, I knew that the game was coming back to Australia to a million people you know, via satellite and I'm they're going to see me lead the Blues, you know, so I'm, I'm feeling great. And got to the end of the tunnel and I got the ball under the arm and the boys are behind me and it's a nice balmy night on the west coast of, of America and yeah. there's this huge crepe banner that said, Up the Blues. And so I just, I, I went into it flat out. Like I hit it like I'd never hit anything before and it was like a fucking brick wall <laughs> because the whole thing was held together by sticky tape yep. except this little corridor where you could run through because there was no sticky tape and that's what the young girl wanted to point out to me. You know. So the worst part was when I hit the banner, it's, it, because it's sticky tape, it's like a spider's web. I, I couldn't go forwards and I couldn't go backwards. So I've turned around a couple of times and I've looked at Roy Simmons who was the vice captain and, you know, sort of pleading almost, what am I going to do here? And... After the third time I'd looked around at him, he just shrugged his shoulders and he took the whole team around the banner. <laughs> uh, it, was, it wasn't a, a great start to it. But we actually, let's get to the good part, um, Las Vegas. Um, when a few of us from both New South Wales and Queensland were told that we could stay on because our clubs weren't going to play finals football, I just booked a flight to Las Vegas. Like for me it was like going to Mecca. Yeah. I just knelt in front of Caesar's Palace bowing because I thought, oh, I'm home here. <laughs> and, I, and I walked into the Dunes Casino and I looked down and Alan Langer, who I didn't know particularly well, but um, I sat down next to him because I thought, well, he's, yeah, we're going to get on. And we did. Yeah. And was, so we had a, a yeah, everybody gets there. on with Alfie. Yeah. I'd love him. And um, I'll tell you a story and you can make your own mind up whether it's true or not, but we're flying back into Australia from – from the USA, and the Queensland guys were up the front of the plane and us New South Wales guys were up the back of the plane. Why? Well, mate, they're probably in business and we're back in mm-hmm. cattle, you know that. <laughs> and as we're coming in, unbeknownst to the pilot and the co-pilot up in the cockpit, they'd left the intercom button on. So whatever they were saying in the cockpit, we could hear back in the cabin. Yeah. So as we were about to come into Mascot Airport, we heard the, 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 the co-captain say to the captain, anyway, John, what are you going to do when you get back into Sydney? And the captain said, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to have a beer, I'm going to have a smoke, and I'm going to make wild, passionate love to that new blonde hostess at the back of the plane. <laughs> Upon hearing this, we've all not turned around to have a look at the blonde <laughs> hostess at the back of the plane, and you could tell from the look on her face, this was the first she'd heard this was going to happen. <laughs> so she's gone up the aisle, throwing the tray up in the air to obviously give the pilot a piece of her mind, but unfortunately her, Alan Langer was lays back in his seat and he's got his leg out into the aisle. Yeah. So as she's going past, she's actually tripped. But being the gentleman Al Fears, he extended his hand and helped her up and said, slow down, love. He said he was going to have a beer and a smoke first. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fitting, a trip, fitting end of the <laughs> trip, yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the current state of rugby league, Sturlo? Obviously, there's been a lot of talk during the COVID period about the financial situation of the game, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts as well, an ex-player? The most strange thing is, Paul, that the, I'm more confident about the future of the game now because of what we've just gone through. You know, the... Our game has always been one of the most heavily subsidised sports in the world. You know, if, if we had to rely on what we took in through gates, then the players would be on a, a minuscule yeah. amount compared to what they are. So our game was unsustainable in regards to the, the, the spending in it. Um, you know, player payments out of whack in regards to, you know, what the game brings in. So I, we've had, a, I think, Shane Richardson's, described it as a recalibration, and that's mm-hmm. what we needed. And I think, obviously, Peter Volandis has come in, and he's done – look, I was one of those people who, when he said May, you know, end of May, the game will be back, I thought, well, that's that's the height of optimism. 
you know, with the amount of obstacles you knew were going to come up and, and ones that were unforeseen that you didn't quite know. Yeah. And as we found out, you know, the, the referees were talking about arbitration and all these <coughs> different kind of things some some player behaviour. and So there were always going to be difficulties in getting it back, but he's just been... He's been amazing at um, basically saying this is what we want and working towards it and going through all barriers. But I think financially, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have a much better understanding of what our game can sustain. And I think from there's almost a line being drawn in the sand through the pandemic that we now have a, a, a better idea of how our future should go and, and how it should be governed. Yeah. Have you seen a stronger sporting administrator than Peter Volandis before? Well, no, and that's not only um, what he's done to our sport, but you have a look back through the equine influenza. Yeah, incredible. And, and, yeah. um, so, no, he's <clears throat> like, he's just carried all before him. and um, He's an unlikely sort of a fella too, isn't he? Because he, <clears throat> he he just looks like your average bloke, but there's there must be something special about him yeah. in a business sense. I know him personally, but not in a business sense. There must be um, s- some incredible strength there. I think he's just got the cape with the little the S underneath the shirt, isn't it? Under the, yeah, that's, Sturlo, that's the Sturlo he's got the cape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, well, he's been fantastic, and you know, it's not it's not easy to be a sporting administrator, and um, but when you've got a, a focus like he has in in how to get things done, and he obviously has great connections, that um, he's just been the right man in the right place at the right time, but also the wrong time in regards to the world. But um, you know, we needed that kind of leadership and. It's um, he's done some things that I just didn't think were, were possible in the current environment. And the game's back, and you're calling games from a studio at the moment. What's that process like? Well, we're actually going out to game. The commentary. Um, oh, you're out of the game. We've been, yeah. yeah so, right. um, yeah, it's obviously it's a well, bit. What's lo- it like in the <coughs> a bit lonely stadium. out there? Yeah. But then and I know Ray Warren, who um, is uh, he's he didn't want to be put in a position where he had to call off a monitor because he said that for him to be the caller that he is, he he needs to draw from the crowd. Yeah. And his his commentary is based on what the crowd reaction is, that if they're starting to get excited, then he, you know, the game is getting excited. He's, I know it's off on a different tangent, but one of the great joys that I've had in, in working with the media is sitting alongside Rabs. He's, I've watched him hone an art that, it's just been fantastic to watch. You know, I've never seen a guy that just understands um, you know, light and shade, that less is more and all of those kind of things. But he's the most complicated individual. That it, mate, he is any, – any, he's a hypochondriac. <laughs> he's, uh, he's just the most – He's scared of flying. Oh, it? he's terrified of flying. <laughs> we're flying up the Gold Coast one day. It's only an hour trip. And he's sitting, I'm in an aisle seat and he's on the other side of the aisle. And to get him through the flight, he used to have one of those Game Boys, you know, like you just build a brick wall. It's the most boring thing you've ever seen. But yeah. obviously you sit there and you just focus on the Game Boy. So we're flying up the Gold Coast and as he's putting his bag up into the locker above his head, he put the Game Boy down in his seat. So I've reached across and taken out the batteries and, and put it back. <laughs> so we're about to take off and he's got the Game Boy and he's turned it on and it, he's starts to hit it because it's not working and he starts shaking it then he starts and these birds beads of sweat start running down the side i was going to hang on to the batteries for now but after <laughs> i land across this mate i can't i can't do this to you and he doesn't understand that it's more dangerous to get in a car and drive from his house at borkham hills to the shopping yeah, center yeah. than it is to jump on a plane but he's just he's just this quirky individual but he's just now him and fatty have just been been great fun yeah. to to be alongside and i think the best part about the media, and especially Fatty and myself, we understood from day one it could stop tomorrow. Like it can be the most transient oh, yeah. know, vacation. In. So we've always just enjoyed it for what it is. You know, yeah. if we get a, f- and it only takes a change of, of decision up in the boardroom at, at work, you know, they want a different face or a different voice or whatever, yeah. and it's over. So we've just enjoyed every second for what it was and, and had an absolute ball doing so. And Rabs has been a big part of it. Yeah, brilliant. We're probably just about done. Uh, who wins the comp this year, Parramatta? It's got to be Parramatta. Oh, I'm quietly optimistic, but we, that our big test will come. You know, we, if you're going to be a premiership winning team, uh, your defence has to be 
Yeah, it's no it's no fluke every year that the top four defensive sides are basically your top four. Yeah. And I think you have to finish in the top four to win the competition. So that's the area that, that we needed to improve. Melbourne put nearly 100 on us in two games last year. Cronulla put on over 40. You can't have that happen during the course of a season. But... We've got good depth of squad now. We've got we've got some coverage there. If we you know do have some injury problems, which every club does have, I think Brad Arthur's an excellent coach. Mm-hmm. And I want to stop talking about the nineteen eighties as being the Halcyon days. You know, we need to we need to we need to have some success now. So that in twenty years' time, we're talking about Mitchell Moses and we're talking about Clint Gutherson and we're talking yeah, about absolutely. those players the same way that I guess you know we're lucky to be spoken about in the eighties. But that you now it's. It's way too long since we've tasted success. The, the club is ready made for success. The fans deserve it. And um, got a brand new stadium. Exactly. So everything is in place. We just now have to get the job done where it counts, you know. And um, I'm quietly optimistic that we're heading in the right direction. Sterla, thank you so much for giving us your time today. And um, I think tonight I'm going to be like one of those coaches. I'm going to wake up every couple of hours and <laughs> I'm not I'm crying, but not believing I spent half the day with you. So thank you nah, so mate, much. It, look, it's it's an honour to be here, thank and you. Um, you know, like I say, we go back a long way. So there's, it's easy to sit and talk, and I think we have a similar understanding and a different mentality of of um, of, I suppose, life, but yeah, life through sport, especially. So um, it's nice to talk to like-minded people. No, thanks, Della. We really appreciate it. Thank Cheers, you. Ben, thanks, thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks, Della. Don't forget to subscribe. Standing eight. Um, YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify.